I was watching the news the other day, and I saw a story that, frankly, terrified me. In an attempt to quiet the fears that the news story kindled in my spirit, I reflected back on a passage of scripture that I had come to appreciate in Leviticus 26, 6. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. An unexpected benefit of my quick search for that passage was the discovery that God makes the same point very often in Scripture. I hadn't taken particular notice previously, but my study revealed just how intentional God is about eradicating fear from the lives of His people. Through the 8th century prophet Micah, he asserts, They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. But it doesn't end there. The words, none shall make them afraid, appear repeatedly in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, and Zephaniah. Reading these words reminded me of the fact that God passionately stands in opposition to that which would introduce fear into the lives of those whom he seeks to lead. I recalled how God recoiled painfully when Adam fled from him in fear after having faithlessly eaten of Eden's forbidden fruit. God who is self-described as being the embodiment of love, simply will not abide a relationship tinged with fear. That's why the Bible is filled with God's voice inviting us to transcend our fear in Isaiah 8.12, Exodus 20.20, Psalm 118.6, and beyond. As I contemplated how deeply resolved God was to remove fear from our lives and how hard God was working to lead us to a place where we might be able to live unafraid, one of those ubiquitous TV political commercials came on. It featured a very well-known political candidate, and I noticed that the entirety of his message was aimed at producing fear. It dawned upon me just how fear-based today's politics are, and that led me to ask myself if today's politics are in opposition to the purposes and intentions of the God who wants us to fear not. Worse still, it seemed that some politicians have become masters in this arena. In the forefront is one politician who has said things like, and I quote, Soon you won't have a country anymore. You're pretty close to not having one. You better hope I get elected, close quote. Even though this candidate is of immigrant stock himself and is married to immigrant women, he continually stokes xenophobic fears with statements like, Immigrants will walk into your kitchen. They'll cut your throat. Your towns, your cities, your country is being destroyed. When it comes to crime, this candidate paints a picture of a dystopian horrorscape, saying, you can't walk across the street to get a loaf of bread. You get shot, you get mugged, you get raped. In other words, in direct contradistinction to God's attempt to get us to fear not, this candidate is saying, be afraid, be very afraid. This is where politics bleeds, and the metaphor is intended, into the realm of spiritual concerns. This politician's crusade to stoke the flames of existential terror and fear becomes more than simple campaign rhetoric. It actually stands in opposition to the divine will and the intentions of a loving God. While it is normal and healthy to pay attention to the intermittent stimuli of fear, after all, that rattling in the tall grass could be a venomous snake, a steady diet of fear will actually warp and distort a healthy living perspective. The late psychotherapist Ivan Agazarian, the developer of systems-centered therapy, advanced the notion that when people become entrenched in fear, their survival instincts kick in, causing them to lose the ability to take in information or learn new things. For example, if you're walking through a beautiful forest on a brilliantly sunny day, and you encounter a grizzly bear, suddenly you see neither beautiful forest nor brilliant sun. All that you can take in is that threatening bear. Now that's a distortion, but if you encounter a bear in the woods, it is a life-saving one. However, a problem is created when that distortion becomes normalized. Where everywhere you look, all you see are bears, and you can't seem to take in information that will allow you to move beyond your distorted perspective. You have then become a slave to your own fear, incapable of hearing and seeing other truths that might set you free. I can see then why God is insistent on freeing us from fear, 
because fearful people are neither free to hear him, nor can they take in information to learn new things that might lead them forward. Conversely, I can also see why some leaders would use fear as their primary motivating tool. They want people to narrow their perspectives, and they prefer having followers who will shut out new information that may incline them towards growth and new ideas. It makes those people easier to manage and control. Now, politics are what they are, and we all have the right to make individual choices. But from a spiritual perspective, I believe that we should be inclined to look for civic leadership that appeals to our hopes and aspirations rather than to the baser level of our fears and anxieties. So when a leader continually pushes our fear factor button, we should become wary about that individual's interest in trying to limit our ability to take in new information, and we should consider the possibility that that leader may be trying to narrow our perspectives so that they may better control us. But more importantly, we are called upon to realize that the approach and strategy of that would-be leader is diametrically opposed to the intentions of a loving God who does not want us to have a spirit of fear. We find that in 2 Timothy 1.7. For the sake of our own spiritual health and progress, we have to force ourselves to break free from the siren song of fear and allow ourselves to consider new thoughts and open ourselves to the learning of new things. This election season invites us to shake off the tentacles of the fear merchants and to transcend the specter of fear and terror, both real and imagined, through courageous hope and real faith. Ask yourself, while vetting those who seek your support, is this candidate addressing me from the perspectives of my hopeful aspirations, or are they attempting to shroud my vision through the shadows of fear? The counsel of a man considered wisest of all may prove helpful for us as we prepare as godly people to participate in this fall's election season. His words, found in Proverbs 29, 25, say, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe.